the new year stumbles out of the gate, but the markets take it in stride. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard, Tony Ressler of Aries Management, Discovery CEO David Zasloff. Instead of being one of seven or one of eight in scripted series and scripted movies, we're one of one. Megan Green of Harvard, John Hope Bryant of Operation Hope. You're going to see, I think, a focus on small business, which is the right place to start. Barbara Perry of the University of Virginia. Nothing like that has happened in this kind of context when the Senate and the House were attempting to engage in their constitutional and statutory ministerial duties. And Christina Hooper of Invesco. If we thought we'd ease into 2021, boy, were we wrong. Georgia proved odds makers wrong by electing two Democrats to the Senate, giving President-elect Biden the razor-thin majority that he needed. I am going to the Senate to work for all of Georgia. Let's unite now to beat this virus and rush economic relief to the people of our state and to the American people. Congress convened as scheduled to confirm that Mr. Biden had indeed been elected president, only to have President Trump claim his election was stolen from him. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. And trigger a mobs taking over the Capitol in the middle of the counting of electoral college votes and delaying the inevitable by a few hours. To those who wreaked havoc in our capital today, you did not win. Violence never wins. Let's get back to work. And maybe most important, all those promises of mass inoculations of the COVID-19 vaccine started to look just a little overblown. We will get there, but not quite as fast as we'd hoped. We should have done better, but I think we should wait until we get into maybe the second or the third week in January to see if we can now catch up with the original pace that was set. And through this extraordinary week, the markets, well, the markets didn't really even blink. With all the major equity benchmarks setting new record highs, the S&P 500 led up by energy and financials, and Tesla having its 11th consecutive session of gains and helping out the NASDAQ 100. At the same time, treasuries were weaker, with the yield on the 10-year reaching almost to 125 basis points. As weak jobs numbers and President-elect Biden's talking up more stimulus put the re re reflation trade very much back in play. And if you had any doubts about that, just take a look at the Russell 2000. It set its own new records before giving back just a little bit on Friday, but it still ended up well above that 2050 mark. To help us sort through all this and maybe to understand what happened in the markets, we welcome now Christina Hooper. She's Invesco Chief Global Market Strategist. Christina, always a pleasure to have you with us. So this looked like a rising tide. Give us a sense of what is rising that's lifting all these boats. Well, I think it has a lot to do with the kind of environment we had before we entered this week. Number one, of course, we had extraordinarily accommodative monetary policy, and that matters a lot. It really creates a positive bias for stocks. Uh, and then, of course, we got news in the fourth quarter of the development of multiple vaccines with highly, uh, with, that were highly effective at protecting against COVID-19. And so that really was a game changer in terms of expectations for 2020. We know at some point, once there is mass distribution of these vaccines, we'll have a robust and inclusive economic recovery. Uh, so we went into this week with some positives. We also got a surprise, albeit small, fiscal stimulus package uh, as a late Christmas gift. Um, so uh, that really uh, started uh, started off the week in very positive territory. We got surprise news about Georgia. Uh, I don't think many people, if at all, expected both seats to go Democratic, as you said. Uh, and I think there was concern in advance that that might be a problem that could create headwinds for the stock market. But the stock market looked at it as an opportunity to get even more fiscal stimulus. And it was viewed as a net positive. Oh. And so the horror of what we saw in terms of the capital being overtaken was really overlooked. Um, 
stocks had blinders on and we're just looking ahead to what looks like a, a, a very attractive recovery. So if, if that's attractive, that recovery, because of the combination, as you say, of vaccines plus a combination of monetary policy and more stimulus, which sectors does that benefit more? Where should people be looking to put their money as opposed to other places? Well, the more powerful um, the factors are, the more powerful the catalysts are for economic growth, uh, the more robust the recovery, and that suggests uh, a more powerful rotation towards cyclicals. Uh, so I would expect uh, consumer discretionary to do very well in this environment, energy, uh, financials. Uh, and so... Um, Having said that, though, I think many of the trends that accelerated during the pandemic uh, are likely to hold, and that should continue to benefit technology. So I think we can see something of a barbell. And, and let's face it, in this kind of environment, uh, to a certain extent, a rising tide is going to, to lift all boats. What about valuations? Where do you think they're particularly stretched? Because there's a lot of back and forth about whether there's a bubble or whether it's just a very robust market. There's no bubble in stocks, in my opinion, but valuations are clearly stretched in the U.S. in areas like technology. But having said that, with such incredibly accommodative monetary policy, um, it, it's, it's a more forgiving environment for valuations, uh, where the real opportunities are, of course, are, are in more of the cyclicals, but even um, uh, more so outside the United States, and I think emerging markets in particular. Asia EM uh, is a very attractive uh, area, not just from a valuation standpoint, but certainly also from a valuation standpoint. Christina, you mentioned stimulus, the prospect of even further stimulus coming up. How vulnerable is the stock market right now to that promise of stimulus? Because we saw even at the very end of the week on Friday, on the one hand, the market sort of sold off when Joe Manchin, the rather moderate senator from West Virginia, said, I'm not sure about this $2,000 a person. And then President-elect Biden came back and said, oh, no, we're going to have a big stimulus. You saw the market go back up. Well, it's certainly vulnerable. But again, I would say that there are so many more uh, positive catalysts right now that I think the bias remains upward, but we could easily see some hiccups. Uh, the, the recovery, though, was quite quick after that disappointment this afternoon. Uh, and what about small caps? Because as I mentioned, the Russell 2000 sort of shot the lights out. It really surprised a lot of folks. I think small caps are very attractive, and I should have mentioned that in talking about cyclicals. Um, that's an area should, that should very much benefit from the current economic environment and what we expect to unfold this year. Where should investors be cautious right now? Be careful. Treasuries. <laughs> and uh, and uh, to a greater extent, I think we should make sure that our exposure to the U.S. is in check. Certainly, we want to have an adequate exposure to the U.S., but there are, are many opportunities outside the U.S. And again, I can't stress enough how attractive Asia EM looks right now. Uh, did the U.S. hurt itself as a country to invest in with what happened, that shocking incident with the attack on the Capitol? Or is that just a passing cloud? That is a passing cloud. And let's face it, uh, democracy survived uh, this challenge. And uh, I, I think what we have to look forward to is probably a, a greater embracing of, of democracy going forward and a strengthening. Um, uh, setbacks can often uh, create opportunities and also can cause us to reaffirm that which is important. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you about Bitcoin, given what happened this week. Do you have any thoughts on Bitcoin briefly? Well, actually, that should have been my answer to the question about bubbles, um, because I do think that Bitcoin valuation is very high. Uh, I know that there's a lot of excitement around it, but we've seen this before uh, in just the last few years. So I do expect that Bitcoin will disappoint many this year. Will it stabilize at all because institutions are not going into it, do you think? Well, I certainly think that is a positive factor for right. Bitcoin, um, but there is also just right. a, a mass frenzy beyond the institutions. Yeah. <laughs> and so so that usually s seems right. a little like tulip mania. Yeah, it's a little bit of a frenzy. Thank you so much. It's always great to have you with us. That is Christina Hooper, and she's the global investment person for Invesco. Coming up, the historic Senate runoff elections in Georgia and what John Hope Bryant says they could mean for small business as the driver for economic justice. Small business has proven in the pandemic to be uh, what, we've, what you and I have always known, 
the, the base bone, the backbone of this economy. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Control of the Senate hung in the balance this week, and to the surprise of many, the two Democratic challengers won both of the runoff elections, giving President-elect Biden a razor-thin margin in the Senate and sending the first-ever black senator to Washington from Georgia. But John Hope Bryant, founder of Operation Hope, says that when it comes to civil rights, the key is economic opportunity. This concept of civil rights and civil rights, that the real color is green, and that we need to pre provide social justice through economic empowerment, through home ownership and small business creation, and wealth creation, is something not foreign to Reverend Warnock. And you'll see, I think you'll start to see a moderation of him, a moderating leadership from him that I think most people will appreciate. I think likewise, and I've been contacted by the Biden administration transition team, you're gonna see, I think, a focus on small business, which is the right place to start. Uh, that's where most wealth creation from my white counterparts came from. And, and there's almost, a, there's almost uh, was it $98 trillion, I believe is the number, uh, of my white counterparts. Uh, they own 90% of all equities and all wealth in this country. That comes a lot from small business. That's where jobs come from. 53% of all jobs in this country are employers with 50 employees or less. Uh, conversely, half of black businesses were sidelined in, in the coronavirus, 41%. And 96% of all black businesses, as you know, David, don't have an employee. I'm gonna repeat that. 96% of all black businesses in this country are sole proprietorships with no employees. So how do you create wealth? How do you create jobs when you don't have uh, the mechanism to do so? So, so, so I think you're gonna see a massive focus on not just uh, some raw stimulus, that's not enough. That, that, that is actually can be negative if that's all you do. You have to turn the stimulus into an investment. You're going to see that in, I think, small business. And I think you're going to see it in massive internship programs. Does this make the Small Business Administration administrator a critical position in the Biden administration? I, I do believe it does. I, it, it's been a titular member of the cabinet in the past, but I believe now uh, small business has proven in the pandemic to be uh, what we've, what you and I have always known, the, the base bone, the backbone of this economy and of jobs. And I think that's going to get special recognition uh, in the next couple of years. I think that people are going to be pleasantly surprised. I think you're seeing it in the in the way the, the markets are, are responding. You're seeing, I had a billionaire friend of mine this morning text me and say, well, I guess my taxes are going up for good reason. I mean, so <laughs> it, he, he was he was like, look, I don't mind it if, if they, go, they go up. If we're talking about social justice through economic empowerment and uplift and smart, smart taxation, where all boats rise. That was John Hope Bryant, founder, chairman, and CEO of Operation Hope. Key to the Georgia runoff elections was the record voter turnout, particularly from people of color. The majority, uh, they're disproportionately young, so voters under the age of 29, um, and disproportionately people of color uh, with a focus and an emphasis on black voters. And one of the differences in the Atlanta area came from the professional sports teams led by Tony Ressler, lead owner of the Atlanta Hawks, as they turned their venues into polling places. The State Farm Arena in the runoff was open for the first week of the runoff and, and had extraordinary numbers, I might add. But we also introduced and helped and trained our friends at Mercedes-Benz Stadium and the owner of the Atlanta Falcons Arthur Blank has jumped into the, shall we say, early voting process, making his stadium available, helping even further with early voting, making it accessible, making it efficient, making it safe, uh, frankly, making it in and out in under 20 minutes. Uh, this is all part of the process, we think, that has helped uh, the voting process. So, 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 Tony, you are, first and foremost, a very astute investor, and so you pay attention to results, measurable results. How are you going to measure success here? How are you going to measure yourself and say, yes, we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish, or not? Oh, we, we measure success by whether or not we're helping get out the vote. Uh, not who wins, but whether we help get out the vote. And there's no doubt that early voting at State Farm Arena and Mercedes-Benz Stadium helped get out the vote 
helped people put or I should say, go to vote with a with a better, more comfortable feeling that it could happen in 20 minutes and not five hours. Uh, so to me, that process has helped. And I, I think if anything, uh, if you looked at uh, the city of Atlanta or Metro Atlanta a year or two ago, vis-a-vis -vis voting and access to voting, I don't think it was something we'd all be proud of. Uh, but I would say today, we're very proud of the ability for folks to get out to vote and frankly, the numbers uh, that are out there voting. So we should all be proud of that. Uh, Tony, there's no doubt in talking to you over the recent weeks that you're trying to do good down there. Can you also do well, and well particularly for the Hawks franchise? As a citizen there, does it affect you as a sports franchise when you really participate in the local community? And I will say it's not just in voting that you've been doing down there in Atlanta. Listen, we, we've committed ourselves uh, and we think we are a community asset, whether we're helping in voting rights, whether we're helping in K-12 public education, uh, whether we're helping with black economic empowerment, uh, whether we're helping with, frankly, the, uh, the, the empowerment of black financial institutions and the refinancing of certain uh, loans that we might have as, a, as an organization or as a franchise. Uh, no, we're, we're proud of the fact that we think we are helping the community we live in. Uh, and by the way, making State Farm Arena a voting location that makes voting more accessible, please understand, we've had enormously positive support from uh, all of our fan base, uh, from black, from white, from Republican, from Democrat, uh, from Hispanic, from Asian. The, 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 the support has been uh, really enormous uh, to help make voting more accessible. That, that's been a positive. I don't know whether that helps us uh, make more money long term or whether we have more fans as a result. Uh, but I do think the commitment we have to being a positive member of the community to help where we can, um, I think it's the right thing to do. And I think hopefully it will help our franchise. That was Tony Ressler, executive chairman of Aries Management and lead owner of the Atlanta Hawks. Coming up, the unprecedented assault on the U.S. Capitol this week from a mob of Trump supporters. Political scientist Barbara Perry of the University of Virginia puts it into a broader perspective. Careful when you split off from your party. Third parties or splinter parties uh, tend not to work very well. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Riots broke out on Capitol Hill this week as a mob stormed the Capitol to disrupt the counting of the Electoral College votes, driving the House and the Senate from their respective chambers and delaying the proceedings. It was history being made and not in a good way, as political scientist Barbara Ann Perry of the University of Virginia's Miller Center explained. Nothing like that has happened in this kind of context when the Senate and the House were attempting to engage in their constitutional and statutory ministerial duties to certify the Electoral College winner of the 2020 election. Now, you know, people will go all the way back to 1814 and, you know, during the War of 1812, a foreign power, the British, came and invaded Washington and they burned the Capitol and they burned the White House as James Madison and Dolly Madison had to run for their lives uh, from the executive mansion. But in, in this context, in a word, no, nothing like that has ever happened in our history. So, so I'll confess, I, I, I was not around in 1814, but I was around <laughs> as a fairly young man uh, in the 1960s uh, when we did have marches, very large marches across the country, particularly in Washington. I remember Richard Nixon holed up in the White House. Is there some parallel with that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and we haven't even mentioned 1860, 1861, when in response to a presidential election, that is of Lincoln, uh, you had, to begin with, seven states secede from the Union and a total of 11 to form a whole wholly new nation within the United States, the Confederacy. So, yes, we've had that in 1968. I do, I do as well remember it as a young person. Uh, awful, awful. Think of Chicago. Uh, think of the Democratic Convention that year. Think of the assassinations of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. So our, our leaders being gunned down. Uh, and yes, the, the uprisings of the race riots, the student uprisings. Uh, so it's not as though we've never been through this. But when I'm asked about yesterday's context, again, the Senate and the House attempting to do their constitutional statutory duties in the role of, of presidential election. No, we've never had that. And we've never had a mob 
um, again, short of the British, a foreign invader, uh, break into the Congress uh, and attempt to take, in effect, take power. Robert, I know you are a student of various presidencies. I'd like to ask about a president presiding over a true division within his own party. We had, before the riots yesterday, we had Donald Trump Jr., the son of the president, basically speaking to that crowd on the ellipse and saying, this isn't the Republican Party at all. This is what he said in part. This isn't their Republican Party anymore. This is Donald Trump's Republican Party. So, so Barbara, among so many extraordinary things, I found that extraordinary uh, with the son of the president saying this is not the Republican Party. This is Donald Trump's party. Do we have parallels to that? I mean, maybe bull moose under Teddy Roosevelt or something? Sure. We've had these splinter groups. Uh, but particularly 1912, where you have the former president, Teddy Roosevelt, who decides he wants to run again and, and can constitutionally at that point, wants to run again. Uh, he is his protege, William Howard Taft, is the incumbent president. But Teddy doesn't like the way he's going because it, he's not progressive enough. So he splits his own party into forms the Bull Moose Party, the third party, the progressive party, uh, and therefore causes Democrat Woodrow Wilson to win the 1912 election. So careful when you split off from your party. Third parties or splinter parties uh, tend not to work very well. That was Barbara Ann Perry of UVA's Miller Center. Now for a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. David, after some confusing flip-flopping from the New York Stock Exchange on Monday, January 11th, the ADRs of three major Chinese telcos will be delisted in compliance with an executive order signed by President Trump in November. This as we mark the one-year anniversary of the U.S.-China Phase 1 trade deal on January 15th. Also in focus in Asia, earnings. About 200 companies on the regional index are set to report before month end. Up to bat next week, Apple supplier TSMC, Indian software giant Infosys, and conglomerate Reliance Industries, which, by the way, is led by India's richest person, Mukesh Ambani. Danny? Thanks, Sophie. After a week where a lot of Europeans' attention was placed on the scenes in D.C., it now turns back to Europe and the coronavirus pandemic, where in Europe it's quickly becoming one of the hot spots of this latest wave. Pressure is mounting to secure more vaccine doses and quickly give people those shots. There's been a lot of criticism over European leaders on that. The European Commission said it did secure 300 million more doses of the Pfizer beyond tech vaccine. So now the question is, how quickly can they distribute those in the coming weeks? Scarlett? Thanks, Danny. New year, new earnings season. Financials will take the lead with BlackRock and First Republic reporting their fourth quarter results on Thursday, followed by JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup on Friday. Analysts expect banks to say that loan demand is lackluster as they continue to set aside money to cover potential bad loans. But at the same time, the everything rally will likely boost their trading revenue. Now, speaking of lenders, a firm will start trading next week. The fintech company plans to raise almost $940 million in its IPO. And finally, the annual Consumer Electronics Show is happening virtually. Spanning four days, it'll set the stage for what's next in the tech industry. David, back over to you. Thanks to Sophie, Danny, and Scarlett. Coming up, the media world turns to streaming, and we hear all about it from David Zasloff of Discovery on the week he put his streaming horse into the race. What we did learn watching Disney and uh, Chapik and Iger have been very effective is that clarity of what you are really matters. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. The pandemic has moved us all online for work, for shopping, and most definitely for entertainment, taking a definite toll on the box office. According to Comscore, movie theater ticket sales were down 80% last year, bringing in just about $2 billion in the United States. Give me the opportunity to open our cinemas. We are keeping the cinemas safe. People want to go back to the movies, and, but they want to see the new movies. 
To make matters worse, Warner Brothers decided to put all of its 2021 films on HBO Max at the same time they hit the theaters, stripping movie houses of their exclusive 90-day windows. Even the world's largest movie theater chain, AMC, is looking for a $550 million lifeline to stave off bankruptcy. I don't think anyone has demonstrated that streaming movies at home is a way the public wants to see them, or that it creates franchises and ancillary markets. The backbone of streaming is still episodic television, and that's why everyone sitting on their couch, and that's why I'm sitting on my couch, and I can't wait to get off it to go to the movies. The shift to streaming on the small screen didn't start with the pandemic, but it sure has gathered steam with it. At the end of its 2023 quarter, Netflix was up to 195 million paid subscribers. That's 23% more than the year before. And it's not just Netflix. The average U.S. household now subscribes to three different streaming services. Since the end of 2019, Disney Plus, HBO Max, and Comcast's Peacock have entered the streaming scene. Disney Plus got its star power from The Mandalorian and HBO Max enticed subscribers with a Wonder Woman movie. Everyone likes to talk about streaming. We've seen those numbers uh, increase. Uh, linear TV was always on a de decline. It's death, although I don't think it'll happen as fast as predicted. Discovery is taking a different approach to streaming. Its cooking, home improvement, and true crime offerings provide a casual rather than glitzy viewing experience. I asked Discovery CEO David Zasloff what makes Discovery Plus different from its competitors. We've been working at this for about five years to aggregate the right IP and to build a strategy to, to, to transform Discovery from a cable and free-to-air company to a global IP company. Uh, it's the reason we did the Scripps deal. We thought that food and HG were global IP products where we own all of it. It's the reason that we did a very big deal with the BBC to own all the, their entire science and natural history library, including Planet Earth and Blue Planet. It's why we did the deal with Oprah and why we did Chip and Joanna Gaines. So we looked at the marketplace and we saw how effective Netflix was as a global power. Uh, and Disney now has become, the two of them, two global powers that can reach most consumers anywhere in the world, or over time they will. But they're scripted series and scripted movies. And there's seven other people trying to be like them and competing with them. But if you look at how people watch television, about 45% of what they watch is scripted series and scripted movies. But the other 50 or 55% is us. It's Oprah, it's Chip and Joe, it's the Property Brothers, it's Discovery, it's Planet Earth, it's food. Yeah, uh, and so we have been quietly aggregating all that content here in the U.S. David, you told me in the past, as a leader, one of the things that you have learned is that as a, the strategy never stays static, uh, that it's never what you start out with. It evolves over time. You respond to various phenomenon. How is the strategy for you in streaming today different than it would have been a year ago as you've gotten to see things like Disney Plus come out and also some other significant streaming services? How has it changed? We've always seen that we don't believe you can compete unless you're global. The idea of building a product and being U.S. only, even though the U.S. is 330 million homes, we always felt that we need to be global and we need to own all of our content. So that piece we've been aggregating for the last five years and producing. That's how we emerged with, you know, 50, with 1,000 uh, hours of original content on this product. But what we did learn watching Disney, and uh, Chapik and Iger have been very effective, is that clarity of what you are really matters. They, if every time you see the Disney brand, you then see Pixar, Star Wars, uh, Disney Family, and it's very clear that from a curation perspective, when you look at Disney, they let you know exactly what it is. They're not saying watch a show. They're saying we're a great home if you love these brands. And you know there was a lot of talk of brands going away. Brands have, been, have never been more important and great characters that people love, we believe, have never been so important because it's hard to curate. Everyone's asking, what should I watch? What should I do? When you go to Disney, it's pretty easy. You could say, you know, I love Marvel, so I'm going to go hang around in that world. And so we've really driven very hard into that, which is our core DNA anyway. But when people come to us, they see, if you love HG or food or uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines or Discovery and Planet Earth, 
or crime was a huge genre for us that people were very familiar with those brands and whether it's Martha or Oprah, the characters that we have, Mike Rowe. So we think we have something very unique, but we did lean harder into the characters and the brands. And we also saw that we need more original content. And that's why we're launching, we launched with over 50 original series um, because, and, and a lot of exclusivity. The only place to get Chip and Joe is on Discovery Plus. Most of the 90 day library, which is the number one show on television and a great young demographic is, gonna, is on Discovery Plus with over 150 hours of original content and new 90 day content every week. So the idea is yes, we have a library as big or bigger than Netflix, but we need original content and we need to go forward with the great brands and characters. Uh, and the other thing that I think we're really lucky with is we come at a moment now, we're like just at the right moment to launch. Disney has been really successful globally, so is Netflix, but part of that was introducing people to how do you buy a product like this? How do you move it from device to, to device? getting used to viewing and, and buying a product. And as we hit January, a lot of these great services, people have watched a lot of the content on there. So we emerge now with a fresh library as, you know, as, as big as Netflix that most that has never been offered before in, you know, in terms of being everything we have. We all know how to buy these. How many of them are we going to buy? And in the end, how many major services will it be? You were there in the room creating MSNBC and CNBC, some of the great cable channels. As you go forward in the future, how many streaming services is the average American or that, for that matter, European or per person around the world going to subscribe to? Look, uh, there's eight, seven, eight, nine, ten players trying to be in the scripted series, scripted movie business. Very difficult. You already have two guys with 150, 200 million homes. A lot of them aren't going to make it. And from a curation perspective, consumers, it's just too confusing to have 14 different. The great thing that we think is that we go really well with this. If you have Disney, you're going to want us as a companion. If you have Netflix and Disney, you're going to want us. If you have HBO and Disney, you're going to want us because we're different. Uh, so we're a great companion to those guys. And we do think they'll be a willowing out. A lot of them won't make it because they're competing with each other and they have the same proposition. That was David Zasloff, president and CEO of Discovery. Coming up, the Federal Reserve stays on course, but Megan Green of Harvard explains why that doesn't mean they are optimistic about the economy. In line with expectations, they're pretty pessimistic about the upcoming months. It's gonna be a hard winter. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. This week, we got to see the minutes of the Federal Reserve's meetings at the end of last year, and FOMC members, for the most part, seem pretty happy with where they are. Though Megan Green of Harvard's Kennedy School did go through the risks the Fed may be facing in 2021. They changed their language around uh, continuing bond purchases. So instead of saying they'll continue for coming months, they said they'd continue until they'd reached sufficient progress on hitting their targets. Um, but they were also pretty careful to say that those targets wouldn't be quantitative, they'd be qualitative. So if that feels kind of frustrating and vague, it, it, it is, and it's intentionally so. Um, there was widespread expectations in early December among market participants that the Fed might actually try to extend the, the duration on their bond purchases to keep the long end of the yield curve down, and there was very little appetite for that uh, in the Fed minutes. Uh, that, of course, was before the 10-year yield started creeping up uh, in recent days, so that, that might have changed already since mid-December when these Fed minutes um, were recorded. And then finally, the Fed talked a little bit about their outlook, and you know, in line with expectations, they're pretty pessimistic about the upcoming months. It's going to be a hard winter, but they're hoping that a vaccine will result in a release of pent-up demand and a recovery in the second half of this year. So they were much more optimistic, but there are so many risks around that view. I think that's worth keeping in mind. Well, it's interesting, as I understand it, what they said is on the question of inflation specifically, the risk was the downside. That is to say, we'd undershoot rather than overshoot. But this, of course, was before we had those two seats go to Democrats in Georgia. Do you think it's a different world for the Fed today than it was just two days ago? 
Well, so a lot has happened since these Fed minutes, even just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I, I actually don't think that we're in a different world, but I do think that the markets seem to be expecting that we are and that that might be a risk. So I mentioned the 10 year yield was up, um, particularly off of the back of yesterday's Georgia Senate results. And that's on the basis that we'll probably get some kind of stimulus out of this government with, with the Democrats in control of the Senate. And, and that's probably right, but it is worth considering that might not be a linear process. It will require absolute unity amongst the Democrats in the House and the Senate to get significant fiscal measures passed. And so I think we might see wobbles along in the process. Um, these minutes also happened before there was a new variant, a new contagious variant of uh, COVID-19, which we've seen ripping through Southeast England. And so I do think that, you know, the Fed said that they were optimistic that a widely distributed vaccine would really lead to a rebound and that could feed into inflation. But actually with this new variant, I think there's a risk there. And of course, our vaccine rollout has been pretty sclerotic. Hopefully we'll get better at that. Um, but right now it's not looking great for a massive rebound because it's not looking like we're getting vaccines in arms quickly enough. And then finally, it's worth pointing out that we've, we've run an experiment where we've had massive amounts of stimulus before recently in 2018. And if we learned one thing from the Trump administration, it's that you can go ahead and provide significant stimulus when the economy is running pretty hot, it's really ticking along and not generate significant inflation. So I, I really question, even if we got the stimulus the markets are hoping for, I question whether we're gonna generate a lot of inflation with that, a lot of sustained inflation with that when the economy is still in a hole. That was Megan Green of Harvard's Kennedy School. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're going to end the week as we do every week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. He is, of course, former Treasury Secretary. Larry, welcome back. Let's start with the end of the week, if we can, with the jobs numbers. We lost 140,000 jobs, although last month's numbers were revised up somewhat. People thought that it might be bad. The markets actually seem to think maybe this makes stimulus more likely. Were you surprised by the numbers? And what do they tell us, if anything, about the economy? I wasn't amazed by the numbers. I think they tell us that we need to get COVID in the rear view mirror. I think they tell us that there's a limit to what kind of recovery we can have when uh, people are fearful of uh, going outside and getting more fearful. And so I think the number one message from this statistic is the importance of doing vaccinating better than we did testing. And it doesn't look like so far we're doing a very good job of that. That's got to be priority one, um, priority two, and priority three for the new administration. And how much of that, Larry, will require some very targeted stimulus? Because one of the things that we hear from a lot of people is small business is, is what it's all about, particularly when it comes to job creation. And obviously, a lot of those small businesses are in things like retail and particularly leisure and restaurants, things like that. Look, uh, David, it doesn't really matter unless people can go to the store and unless they can go uh, to uh, the restaurant. I think we've done okay with the PPP. I'm more worried about the mass layoffs that have taken place in state and local governments. And I'm more worried about the fear that's keeping people uh, indoors that's keeping people unable to go out and engage in the kind of spending they want to. And I think the longer we have this and the longer we respond just by throwing money, the more complicated problem we're gonna have of a huge pent up demand whenever we start to uh, make some progress. So I'm very focused right now, less on the macroeconomics than on the having effective public health uh, strategies. And in all honesty, I don't think the only culprit uh, has been the politics of the Trump administration as terrible as uh, it has been. I think our medical establishment has not planned in the way it should have for a satisfactory uh, vaccine. Uh, rollout. And I sure hope uh, that is going to change. Uh, 
in a way, David, I link uh, two events. Uh, I link the failure to protect the capital and the failure to be able to organize the use of all the vaccines that are being delivered. Take the vaccine, for example. We have something of a raging debate right now between Governor Cuomo on the one hand and the mayor of New York City, Mr. de Blasio, about exactly who's setting out the rules. Because de Blasio is saying, wait a second, you've got your rules so strict that it means we can't get everybody vaccinated. You should loosen them up some. Who should be calling the shots? As a matter of competence, where should the decision making be? I think that's a hard thing to judge. In general, I think we need to be putting more responsibility on uh, the federal government in uh, some of these areas. And I think that having things be invented and reinvented 50 times is often problematic. I think with respect to vaccines, we need to focus on getting as many people vaccinated as possible. And I think by designing optimal algorithms, according to philosophers and epidemiologists, we have probably made a sacrifice in terms of effectiveness. And I put more emphasis on getting as many jabs into arms uh, as possible. I also don't think we've done the research in the right way, done the planning in the right way with respect to the issue of one versus two vaccines. And I hope uh, when this is over, there'll be a investigation, not just of all the political terrible stuff Trump has done, but also of some of the thinking and decision-making uh, in the medical community. I cannot understand why we did not do more testing and studying that would have enabled us to be making more intelligent judgments right now about first time versus second time uh, vaccinations as the optimal use for controlling the public health problem. I can't understand why we're holding large inventories to give people second doses when they're people whose lives could be saved uh, today. Even if we can't postpone the second doses, we surely can rely on production several weeks from now as the basis for the second dose and use all the doses that we have uh, today. I don't think this is a pretty picture um, at all. And I think among those who are gonna have to do a lot of rethinking are the health and the public health profession. And I would suggest that we've had private health norms in a problem that requires public health solutions. Uh, Larry, let's come back to what the politics could do affirmatively when it comes to the pandemic here. What could be done in Washington? As you referred to, we had just a, a stunning, harrowing event this week with that attack, assault on the Capitol, really an, a, an attempt at armed insurrection. It is no less than that. How might that affect uh, what President Biden, when he is president, can get accomplished in the Congress, particularly when you add the fact we also had, by the way, this week, two seats from this in the Senate go to Democrats from Georgia. So it means that he has an effective, if narrow, majority. It is going to be much, much more difficult to go into reflex opposition to a set of policies that come from the moderate center. And there's a big set of policies, whether it's infrastructure investment, whether it's strengthening uh, education, whether it's making investments in technology that enable us to compete with uh, China, the chances that we can really build back better, those chances have gone uh, way up. I still think there's a prospect that we're gonna fix things and get things together and a couple months from now, the vaccination process is gonna be back on track. And with it, the economy is really gonna be taking off. And if Joe Biden has that momentum, the Republicans have a desire to show that frankly, they're not crazy. And the best way to demonstrate that is going to be for their moderates to cooperate. I think we can see more progress and there's a larger window than I would have thought plausible uh, a month ago. Now that's no certainty and it could easily not happen, but the prospect of more 
um, has to be much more there than anybody thought likely a month ago. Let's wrap up with a quick round of a summer says, and let's start really where you just laid off. The first question is, it looks like there's likely to be more stimulus. What's the right way to do that and the wrong way to do that? More health, more state and local government, getting started on infrastructure, not just sending people uh, checks when disposable income is running already very high. Number two, infrastructure. You've mentioned it more than once. What are the chances that we'll get a really substantial infrastructure package within the next six months? 50-50 or a little better than that, or a little better than that. And that's a much higher number than I would have given a few months ago. And finally, number three, China relations will be sort of toward the top of the foreign policy agenda for the Biden administration. What is likely that will get better or get worse? I'm not very optimistic. It seems to me China's seeking to take advantage of our moment of weakness in quite problematic ways. Okay, thank you so much to Larry Summers, our special contributor of Harvard University. Always great to wrap up the week with Larry. Finally, one more thought. Let's get back to work. That's how Vice President Pence resumed congressional tallying of the Electoral College votes after the constitutional process was disrupted by a mob invading the Capitol and storming into the two chambers of Congress as a nation watched in shock and anger and sadness. They did get back to work, completing their job and confirming that Joe Biden would indeed be the next U.S. president. The votes for president of the United States are as follows. Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware has received 306 votes. Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida has received 232 votes. The business of government, as well as the business of business, We'll go forward. But before we jump too quickly to the comfortable conclusion that this is a purely political story, let's pause a moment to reflect on that rule of law everyone talks about. Before the riots shut down the proceedings, Senator Ted Cruz of Texas gave an impassioned plea to have what he called an impartial tribunal to review the integrity of the election. One choice is vote against the objection and tens of millions of Americans will see a vote against the objection as a statement that voter fraud doesn't matter, isn't real, and shouldn't be taken seriously. But there had already been 60 different courts who'd done just that, federal and state, including judges appointed by President Trump himself, with none finding any reason to overturn the election results. The rule of law, that recourse to an independent judiciary gives us all personal protection against an arbitrary or an overweening state. But it also is at the very foundation of our markets, our business transactions, our economy itself. The markets may not have been bothered much in the short term with a mob taking over the Capitol, but if we lose faith in the steadfastness of our institutions, it may be a very different story. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.